Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Deborah Schmidtbach, Curator of Decorative Arts and Special Exhibitions at the New York Historical Society. I'm joined tonight by Carol Chervin, daughter of Andre Chervin. Tonight, we will be discussing the exhibition Enchanting Imagination, the Objet d'Art of Andre Chervin and Carbon French Jewelers. Before we begin, I would like to thank our trustees, our chairman's council, and all of our members and other generous donors. Your support allows New York Historical to continue to pursue our mission. New York Historical is currently open on Tuesday through Sunday, so reserve your timed entry tickets on our website. Before we launch into our program, I wanted to let you know that the program will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. You can, you can submit your questions via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any point during the presentation. We have disabled the chat function, so please make sure to use the Q&A. And after the presentation, we will get to as many questions as time allows. So without further ado, um, Enchanting Imagination uh, presents a selection of objects created by the master jeweler, Andre Chervin, and the artisans of his firm, Carvin French Jewelers. Uh, Carvin French Jewelers was founded in 1954, and they are makers of fine handcrafted jewelry for such clients as Tiffany & Company, Cartier, Van Cleef & Arpels, Bulgari, Verdura, Harry Winston, and private clients. Each of the objects that are in the exhibition are one of a kind works of art until a few weeks ago, they had never before been shown to the public. These objects were Chervin's passion and were worked on by him and the artisans in his workshop between the firm's jewelry commissions. These objects are also an example of Chervin's artistic vision when he was free from the constraints of client specifications and deadlines. So without further ado, I also want to introduce Carol Chervin, who worked with us on creating this magnificent exhibition. And Carol and I are going to have a conversation tonight about um, these amazing objects that are now here at the New York Historical Society. So Carol, tell us a little bit about your father's training. How did he become known as the jeweler's jeweler? And if we, yes, thank you. Ah, okay. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. It's a pleasure to be talking with you and to be doing Curator Confidential today. And it's been a pleasure putting together the exhibition. Um, so sure, the, you can see on the slides, um, there is a picture uh, from 1954 of my father in the newly formed Carvin French with some designs on the table. Um, my father was born in France in 1927, born in Paris. Um, he's the fourth of five children. And his um, parents uh, owned a retail jewelry and watch store. Uh, in Paris. His grandparents had also owned jewelry stores in London and Paris, um, but he decided that he wanted to actually make jewelry. At first he wanted to be a watchmaker, but then he switched over to wanting to be a jeweler to make jewelry. And after his, um, after he finished and graduated from the lycée, in Paris, um, he went on to apply to and got into the the best jewelry training school in France, the what is now called the Haute École de Joaillerie, and uh, he learned all the basics of benchwork jewelry um, there. Uh, he then had to do his military service; he was drafted, and then he did his apprenticeship in. In Paris. So he had the formal um, training that Paris is, was so well known for and is still well known for. Um, yeah, thank you, Perry. He then. Actually, Perry, can you go back to this slide previous for a moment? Thank you. Okay. Oh, right. right. <laughs> because, yes, yes, this is where my father, after he, his, his apprenticeship, he's still 24 at the time. Um, no, he's 23, he wasn't even 24. It was in February of 1951. He applied for a visa to come to 
the United States. He actually got a green card um, and took the ship to the United States where he had an aunt and an uncle in Brooklyn. And they had corresponded and he could be put up with them. And they provided him with what you see here um, on the screen, which is, this is the classified ads of the newspaper France Amérique which is the French newspaper, French English newspaper in New York. And they said, look, you can look for a job here. And sure enough, what we have here, which the museum found for us was the exact original ad that my father responded to, went for an interview and landed a job as a bench jeweler within four days of having come to this country. My father says this was the beginning of a tremendous good luck that he had at every turn. And I would add to that, that he also had a lot of talent and hard work as well, but he emphasizes the good luck. Um, if we could have the next slide. Yes. Um, yeah. He met, he met while working as a bench jeweler, his soon to be partner in business, Serge Carponcy while uh, working at Louis Ferrand. And they decided to try to venture out on their own with their own firm. They named the firm Carvin French Jewelers. Carvin is an amalgamation of the first three letters of Serge Carponcy's last name and the last three letters of my father André Chauvin's last name. And this formula was proposed by my mother. And they decided to call it Carvin and they call it French jewelers um, uh, to signify that both of them were French, both French trained. And it was also, as my father explains, it was important at the time um, to, to be French, to, be, to show that you were um, the utmost in training. Um, my father says that people always wanted their jeweler to be French, just like their waiters and their coiffure. So, uh, He's, my father has a sense of humor, as you know. Um, how Carvin French then um, set out with minimal resources, but a lot of gusto and, and showed what they could do. And one of the first clients that, um, that they landed was a very, very good client was Verdura. And they impressed Verdura with their ability to do um, enamel work which was very much in fashion, but very difficult to do. And there were few um, enamelists out there. And they took that job on um, and were very successful and got more and more commissions from Verdura. Another initial client was Raymond Yard. Um, but as you said, Deborah, in the beginning, they went Carbon French, then expanded only by word of mouth to more and more retailers, um, fine jewelry houses, that found that their work was exceptional and um, of really excellent, excellent quality. So and so this photograph that we see from 1957, this is the Carbon French workshop. And Andre Turvin is standing up in the back toward the left. Uh, and next to him is, is Serge Carp Carponcy, his, yes. his partner. And I'm sorry, Carol, you were saying. Oh, no, no were... problem. I, I wanted it, I want it to be a doctor. Okay. Um, so, how you had asked about how um, they became known as the jeweler's jeweler. Yes. And I think that that's um, probably for two reasons. One being um, that Carbon French is not a retail name. And so it's not well known to the public. So it's not uh, everyone's jeweler that they would know of. But it's the jewelry houses, the retail houses that knew of Carbon French. And so it was where they went to for their finest and most complex assignments or commissions. Um, I think the other reason is related is that the owners of those fine jewelry houses themselves, when they wanted to gift jewelry or buy jewelry for themselves, who did they choose to have it made by? They went to Carbon French. and and my father. Well, that, that leads us to um, talking about jewelry and the jewelry is incredibly beautiful. Carbon French has made thousands of pieces of jewelry for firms like Tiffany and Company, Van Cleef and Arpel, 
um, Bulgari, Harry Winston, and Verdura. I mean, we've named many of these these stores um, already. So what do you think distinguishes Carvin French jewelry from the works created by other jewelry manufacturers? Uh, if we well, could have the next slot. Yeah, thank interesting you. Interesting question. I, I um, you know, of course, I may be a little biased, but I, but I think other people might agree that there is a, a commitment to as close to perfection as as possible at at Carvin French, and um, and that means paying attention to every aspect of the pieces of jewelry, and that's not just the front, but it's the back as well, and it's not just the way it looks uh, when it rolls out of the workshop, but how it's going to look in five years, ten years, or fifty years from now, and it's not just making what everyone else can make, but putting that little extra oomph into it. And um, along those lines, um, I will refer to that beautiful necklace. Yeah, on... the necklace is a great example of that. The necklace is uh, designed by Fulco di Verdura, um, and they turned to Carvin French Jewelers to make it. In 19, it was completed in 1964. It's a lotus leaves necklace and it's 18 karat yellow gold with um, blue and green enamel and yellow diamonds. And it's a beautifully made necklace that not just the way it looks, we can't tell from the picture, but it's a very supple and flexible articulated necklace at every joint so that it, it fits no matter what the uh, physiology of the person is who it 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 goes on and there's also a story um behind the beautiful blue enamel um which just sort of illustrates the extra mile that my father would go to um in pursuit of excellence and in, in pursuit of the unusual um this blue this particular uh, ultramarine blue is called bleu madame and my father chanced upon it one day when he was walking in the Marais district in, in Paris, and he spotted a little store. Um, there are a lot of jewelry supply stores in that area, and this was one of them. And he stopped into the store because it looked interesting to him. They were moving boxes around, and it piqued his curiosity. So he went into the store and they said, well, they were moving boxes around because they were closing and they were sending their supplies uh, to auction. He asked if he, they would mind if he would take a look, if he could take a look. And one of the things he found in a small envelope was the powder for enamel and it was labeled Bleu Madame. And he suspected he knew what he was looking at, but he asked them for verification. And it turns out he was right, that Blue Madame was a color of enamel, it was an enamel that had been reserved strictly for the court and strictly for Marie Antoinette, for her ceramics. And this was leftover Blue Madame, 18th century, enamel powder and he had the opportunity to buy it so guess what he did right and, and now it and then made it into a 1964 it, necklace that's it wonderful made it into the 1964 necklace and several other pieces that um they're just a stunning 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 color let's move on to two more pieces of jewelry sure if we can have the next slide mm -hmm. um and so this is a, a beautiful strawberry bracelet and um, a butterfly designed and manufactured for Ralph as Marion. Um, do you, Carol, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, your father's relationship with the Tiffany designer, Donald Claflin? Oh yeah, um, they had a wonderful collaboration. Um, Donald Claflin was a dear, dear man, unfortunately passed away much too soon, too young. And he and my father used to um, collaborate on pretty much everything that that Donald Claflin did for, for Tiffany. Um, by Donald Claflin used to come over uh, pretty much every afternoon over to the workshop at in the in the afternoon so that they could have a give and take about the design and how it was taking shape in actual production, which is something that is 
is is also essential for fine jewelry is you don't just get a uh, a drawing and then boom make it exactly as is no you you have to make adjustments with the designer that you suggest that might wear better that might be less heavy um, that might be more articulated and and this is a ex beautiful example of one of those done by Donald Claflin and the same might be said about this about this beautiful um, large yellow fancy vivid yellow diamond and black and steel uh, brooch that was um, is unusual in the use of black and steel instead of the usual gold which is um, makes it makes it more difficult, but it it makes such a nice contrast and makes the 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 veins really pop. Yeah, it's, it's a gorgeous piece. Let's move on to some of the extraordinary objects that are on display. Yeah, thank you, Perry. So, um, Carol, when did when did you learn about these objects? When do you know when your father started to make them, or when did you become aware of them? And were they in your home growing up? No. Um, well, my father started making objects in the Carbon French workshop with the same artisans and jewelers and lapidaries that were making the jewelry um, in about 1957, before I was born. And he continued. Um, and the ones in this in this um, exhibition are from uh, till about 2013. And um, I was aware uh, generally that he did that, that this was a passion of his, as you said, and, um, and that, uh, there were, there were various ones that were made and I had seen some of them. Yes. But, uh, I really had no idea the extent of how, how many there were and how gorgeous they were until I was working at Carbon French myself, which I started in 2013 and that one after another, they, I, I just saw one after another and uh, they were they were just so extraordinary that I just thought, and not only did I think this, but the very few people who had seen them said, this, this has to be shown, this has to be shown in the museum, just don't delay. <laughs> and, and so we were really, really thrilled to have the uh, New York Historical Society, which is, I think, the perfect place for them to be seen. If we can have the next slide, please. So one of the things that I have found so remarkable about these objects is how how much they uh, show the interaction of um, your dad as an as an artist and the artisans at Carbon French and their collaboration. Um, the other thing is most of these objects come with really amazing stories, either about the materials that they're made of or the process. So the lamp that I'm wondering, Carol, if you can tell us a little bit about the lamp that we're showing here and um, the, the story about how these unusual colors came to be together. Oh, well, um, sure. This is um, the Ruby de Grenouille or the Frog's Rubies um, lamp. It is in this photo, it is turned on, which really, um, really makes the, the rubies and the shade glow spectacularly. Um, the, my father is not shy about color combinations. And that's one of, one of the things that distinguishes uh, carbon French jewelry and is, is he has a fabulous sense about um, what colors will go with other colors, even though it might not be the first combination that other people might think of. When I once asked him, how do you know that two colors are going to work well together and not clash? And he, he said, he said, I look to nature, nature never makes a mistake. So if you find those two colors together in nature, you can put them together in your art and your jewelry. In this case, in this um, beautiful um, boudoir lamp, those are real rubies on the top. They are cut into slices. And as you can see, it's a puzzle piece. And so cutting them exactly so that they would fit all together. And of course, they were not only different shapes in two dimension, but they were different thicknesses to begin with. So they had to be cut by uh, with my father's direction, with the lapidary um, at, at the lapidary side every five minutes, as my father says. 
um, so that the light would pass through appropriately for each one, some having to be cut thicker, some thinner. So it's a lot of trial and error and you don't want to make too many mistakes because it is rubies. And uh, so uh, this is 663 carats of of rubies there. It's on a base, um, as you can see, with the silver frogs that are climbing out of the water, so to speak. The water. I love the frogs. <laughs> and one of them climbing on a ruby to get out of the water. The water is um, rock crystal quartz. And above them, in the beautiful contrast with the rubies, is um, fluorite. And that is a natural crystal formation of fluorite, which my father was just fascinated with when someone called his attention to it at a gem and mineral show in Tucson. They said, oh, Andre, you have to buy this because only you would come up with something to do with it. And he took the challenge and he bought it. But he says that fluorite is very difficult to deal with. Um, my father says, as soon as fluorite sees a drill coming, it cracks. So nope. yeah. this one was, you know, it had to be drilled to get electricity in to the small bulbs um, in the top. And so they didn't have any room for error again on that. Um, the fluorite luckily cooperated and didn't crack. Now, many of these lamps have secret switches. And um, it, we can see it in this, this sketch that we found in the archives of Carbon French. Um, the switch for this lamp is um, underneath the frog's chin, the frog that's facing us. And um, it, you sort of need to tickle his chin to, uh, to turn on the lamp. And I love that. And I love the humor that that brings and how articulated the frogs are in terms of climbing out of their pond. Yeah. I'm going to move us on to the next uh, slide, please. And um, this is a fascinating piece. And um, one that I really admire. What can what does it take to create a piece like this? Uh, how many you know how many artisans work on this? How many hours would something hmm. like this take? Yeah. Um, okay. So that's a good question, and it's um, pretty amazing how many people it takes. I mean, besides my father bringing it all together and supervising everything, um, it takes a couple of of jewelers. It takes a model maker to make a model, for instance, of the of the wheelbarrow here in this case in wax first, and then it gets cast and then jewelers do all the finishing work on it, uh, as well as um, polisher will do also finishing work on it. It takes um, setters. This It has this wheelbarrow with the heart citrine in it has, as you can see, it's just an abundance of, of flowers spilling over the sides and also some growing uh, on the ground there. So those are all cut and set. And um, and some of them have enamel, so it takes an enamelist. Question about how many hours is it we can only guess because um, exact records were not were not available when we, we looked for them, but um, we think that it would take about 400 hours, um, not counting my father's hours, which is just innumerable. Um, but it and how long would it take is another story. It's um, these pieces were not commissioned by any particular client. Um, so they were done only in between other commissioned work. So when a jeweler would have two hours here or there in between other work that they had to do, my father would set them to work at, on one of the objects. And then if that jeweler was hands full and busy for another six months or 12 months, it would sit in the safe and not get touched again. So I was talking with my father the other day about how long this one took with that sort of stop and start, start and stop uh, action. And he said it was probably about 10 years. And that's kind wow. of typical. And some of some of them took 25 or 30 years. Actually. Right. Well, let's let's move on to the next slide because this is the next slide. Um, this is one of uh, several objects in the ex exhibition that really, in my mind, embody your father's love and respect for gems and minerals and the other materials that he worked with. 
as well as um, this sort of back and forth and collaboration with his artisans. So um, these two lamps are made from the same piece of jade? Yes. Okay. And can you tell, would, would you, could you tell us how that came to be? Yeah. So yeah, the two lamps, the one with the aquamarine shank and the one with the rose, a rose quartz shank, um, their, their shades come from the same block of jade. And the jade called moss and snow jade, because it's white with green, um, they were originally just going to make the bigger one. And, uh, but the lapidary in started to, to cut it as my father had specified. And they discovered that they could probably cut another smaller one out from the inner part that they were just going to remove to make the, the globe shape of the, of the larger one. And they, my father said, absolutely. Sure. Let's make a, let's make a pair. And another thing that happened along the way was um, the lapidary discovered that he was about to cut off a beautiful um, section of jade that was bright green apple green green and green apple color and he called my father over and said look look what we have here we didn't did it wasn't expected it you know came up along the way do you want me to just slice that off and just make it uniform and symmetrical and my father said absolutely not he didn't want to sacrifice that beautiful element of the of the jade and looked at what the shape suggested to him, to his imagination. And he thought, it looks actually kind of like a salamander and considered making a making it into salamander, but then reconsidered and said, I know this is going to be a boudoir lamp in someone's bedroom. And I don't think most people want to go to sleep with a salamander on their night table. So better to make it a butterfly. So that's what we see. It's a butterfly and there's the... the the close up of it in the center. But if you look on the left, um, the photo to the left of it, you see on the right of that lamp, you see the the image of the butterfly, which is actually sculpted and sticking up from the in a in a really delicate um, naturalistic way on the side. Let's go to the next slide because I think it, it sort of speaks to what we're talking about. Um, uh -huh. This collaboration. So this is a carbon French holiday card. Yeah. And it, it's a, it's an orchestra, and I love that analogy. Um, so, uh, who are all of these people? <laughs> so, um, at at its most, Carbon French had forty employees, and some were office staff, you know, administrative. But and they're they're in here as well. But mostly, this shows the atelier, and we have my father on the bottom left with the conductor's stick. And my cousin Sylvain on the phone, he also works with a firm. He's also French born on the bottom right. And everyone else you see is, uh, this was done by an in-house designer at Carbon oh. French. Everyone else you see is actually doing a sort of a caricature, a blown up version of what they actually do. So for instance, right in the center, you see a big pear-shaped stone and you have someone yes. with a rag and they're, that's a polisher is polishing the stone and everyone else is sort of doing either what they actually do or or a joke like the foreman on the top right on the on the ladder has that uh, megaphone is you know screaming at people so that's sort of a joke of what he would do and carbon french um my father started this tradition of carbon french sending out handmade hand drawn um and often funny uh holiday cards like this one. What a fantastic record. Can we move on to the next slide, please? And before we talk about um, minerals and materials, um, I just want to remind all of you who are watching, if you'd like to submit questions, please do so through the Q&A function. Um, we've disabled the chat function. So um, please, again, submit questions through the Q&A. Um, back to the show. And one of the things that I've heard your father say, and you say as well, um, and I, I'm paraphrasing, it begins with the materials. So it, it's clear to me that the materials are inspirational, perhaps, or the materials absolutely lead 
to the kinds of works that Carbon French produces. And right, and this is this is just a a shot of showing some of the minerals straight out of the straight out of the lapidary's bench at Carbon French. Some of them polished, like you see some of the um, agate geodes that are actually sliced and polished, and some of them rough, like the um, the on the bottom left. That's a rough piece of coral, and um, the the pile of blue stones. That's rough. Uh, unpolished lapis lazuli, which is one of the favorites of my father for jewelry as well as the obje. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, these are two examples. These are clocks at, that really illustrate um, your father's response to his materials. And um, the apple green of this clock, which is made of chrysoprase, is really stunning. And um, can you tell us a little bit about how your father was able to get this stone? Yes, yes. Um, this this is a this is a clock. It's about this big. It fits in your hand. It feels really beautiful in your hand. Um, and my father's fascinated with 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 clocks and he doodles them all the time. So this one was probably, I'm sure stems from a doodle that he did while he was on the phone doing something else or something like that. But the stone, um, as you said, is chrysoprase. And one day my father was in his office and he was receiving a stone dealer who showed him that he had a collection of this beautiful um, green apple color chrysoprase, some in fairly big hunks and some in small, some polished, some unpolished. And what was special about this was the, the, the awesome color and luster. As it turns out, um, there had been a mine that had the best color and luster of chrysoprase in Australia that had flooded. And it was never going to be able to be opened again because uh, it was irretrievably flooded out. And uh, this dealer had what was probably the last remaining stock of that really fine chrysoprase. He offered my father to buy some and my father couldn't resist. He bought it all. And he took one of the larger pieces and had designed this clock and had his lapidary make it. And this is all carved out of one piece. Amazing. Uh, of, of chrysoprase. Those are pink sapphires around and a mother of pearl inlay on the face. Um, the watch hand, the clock hands, excuse me. Um, my father originally wanted them to be uh, very thinly sliced emeralds. But when they sliced the emeralds really thin, they found they completely lost their green color. So they ventured into fluorite, again, the fluorite that always cracks <laughs> when it sees a, a, a anything coming to cut it. And miraculously, they were able to do it in fluorite and discovered that the fluorite retains its green color when it was even that thin and as it had to be to be so delicate on the, on the hands. Now, the clock next to it, um, this clock is made from a large sapphire. I've never seen such a big sapphire. It's mm -hmm. 606 carats. Now this is not gem, this is not um, gem quality. Gem quality. Right. right. So um, it's just remarkable that your father turned it into a working clock that sits on a beautiful rock crystal easel. Right, right. Because someone asked me when, um, why didn't he uh, excuse me for asking, but they said 606 carats. Why didn't why didn't he make it into 600 rings instead? And um, that was a good question. But this is you know not of the gem quality that you would see in a, a really fine gem, but it's still valuable nevertheless. And um, but I think it's even more valuable and beautiful in this again table table clock or pendulette in a beautiful uh, again one piece of rock crystal that was carved to hold it up and it swivels and then it's embellished just like jewelry i mean it is bejeweled yeah burma rubies and the 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 um, custom cut tapered baguette diamonds let's move on to the next slide and carol what did, what do you think your father got out of making these objects that he didn't get from making jewelry 
he got a good laugh. <laughs> I, <laughs> Clearly with this with these two. Yeah, with these two, he got a good laugh. And seriously, um he got a good laugh, but more seriously, um he got the total freedom as an artist to explore whatever creative idea he wanted to explore, whatever materials he wanted to explore, and to take as long as as he wished doing it. To also to work with the jewelers and the artisans to push them into new directions or um, new skills that that they wanted to try out or to push the envelope on skills that they already had. Um, but uh, the, the 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 laugh, the good laugh and the humor and the wit and the whimsy is apparent in a lot of the pieces, such as the dirty rotten scoundrels in the tub, um, which is. Uh, uh, my father tells a story that he had in mind behind these guys, which is that they were sort of two bit, two bit bank robbers. And after one particularly unsuccessful and frustrating day of not succeeding in robbing a bank, they went to the local inn, asked for a room. And the innkeeper said, not looking like you, you're too dirty and dusty to go in one of my rooms. And he promptly plunked them into a bathtub with their clothes and hats still on. And there they are in this uh, silver and enameled tub with the oxidized silver uh, faucets and and uh, claw feet. But the most wonderful thing about this is that you can take these each of these guys out, remove their rock crystal quartz or lemon quartz hats, flip their heads open, and they are a salt and pepper shaker. That really, uh, yeah, they're very and funny. I think just the humor of that is is one of the big things that my father gets out of making these. And um, next to it, you're seeing one of the many boxes that are in the exhibition. And there's a wonderful quote from your father where he says, you know, there's so many things, and I'm paraphrasing again, there's so many things you can do with a box. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to move us on, though, to the next slide, please. And um, you know, I've I've been asked a number of times now which objects are my favorite, and I it's a very hard question to answer because I've been working with these objects now for over a year, and I've certainly fallen in love with them, and um, I would say I have about twenty five favorites. Yeah. I'm particularly enamored though with the ways that your father works in his respect and love of nature. And I think we see that very clearly in these two objects, particularly in the white water lilies. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how these, how this piece came together? Well, um, this, I, I'm actually not really sure about how it came together, but I can tell you that um, my father, uh, he loved choosing the rainbow obsidian for the water, which is an unexpected choice uh, for water. Uh, it's, it's sort of the opposite color. Usually most people would choose like rock crystal quartz or something like that, but it just heightens the drama. And I think it creates such a, a beautiful contrast with the colors. Um, that is um, jadeite jade for the leaves. And at the last minute when he would have otherwise thought that the piece was finished, he thought, he wanted to add a little bit of life, a little bit of, of, of uh, drama to the to the story of the piece. So besides having one just budding and one fully in bloom, he put two little dew, dew drops on the jadeite leaves, and those dew drops are moonstones. Yeah, that's, that's just, they're so wonderful and charming. Um, I'm going to move us along so we have time for questions. And so if we could have the next slide, please. And so this leads me to an interesting question. Where did your father get all these ideas for the objects? Did he have particular inspirations? Mm. Um, do, do these two pieces lend to an, an answer to that question? Well, um, the strawberry um, bush, uh, the strawberries overflowing out of the um, the, the cash po there is, uh, I think, because my father uh, was always is always fascinated with fruit and particularly loves uh, strawberries or in, remembers the fraise des bois of his childhood in, in France. And uh, he's fascinated with the fruit to the extent that it would not be unusual to see him at our dinner table growing up counting the seeds on the strawberries to see if they all have the same number. 
and to see how they might be arranged. So I think it does come from fascination with nature around him. The the piece on the right as well, that's a small, it's a bonsai of uh, birch trees, which he was inspired from when he was on a train from Helsinki to Leningrad, when he was on a mission, a group mission, to advise the Fabergé um, workshop that was reinstituting itself in Russia. And he saw miles and miles of birch trees in that train trip and was, um, was put in his mind that he wanted to have the shop make, make the birch trees. He thought originally he would decorate them with enamel, but then he discovered that a new jeweler that he, they had hired who had just immigrated from Ukraine had this incredibly rare talent of knowing how to make eggshell mosaic. And that's what was eventually used for the for decorating not the trees that makes it look so much like birch that is real eggshell. It's also found on the on the decorative planter. Yeah, there it's incredible work. Um I actually am going to move us on and I want to have some I want to open up the floor to questions. So if we could have the next slide please and this is Lady Ostrich and one of the things that I love about Lady Ostrich is that she comes off of her her base and can be worn as a brooch. Yes. So with that I will open the floor to questions. Um, what, I'm going to read the questions out loud so everyone can hear them. Um, can you elaborate on how the designs, whoops, it just disappeared. Can you elaborate on how the designs came to be? Was your fa father the final decider on the designs? Were customers able to request specific items made to order? All good questions. Um, the designs came to be in different ways. Sometimes, rarely, my father said he envisioned the whole concept all at once. He would sketch it and he knew exactly how it wanted to look. And again, rarely he would have the in-house designer actually make a formal design. Um, more often than that, my father would conceive of something, he might do a doodle, but then would describe it to the jewelers and uh, or to the model maker, or the lapidary, and just get started and launched into it and then see how it evolved organically um, through the process. And that was a that was a more more common way that it would proceed. What was the last part of that question? Were customers able to request specific items made to order? Oh, yes, and they still are, yes. Yes. Here's another question. Um, in the piece titled My Heavy Heart, is the heart loose or attached to the wheelbarrow? And um, I wanna also add that Heavy Heart has a secret switch. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go back to show the um the um the sure um Perry can we go back to um uh, to heavy heart it's uh let's see slide number uh well Carol why don't you start okay. talking while we'll start we, talking while we, we that, slide number eight or my my slide number eight that was the um the gold wheel barrel with the yes. the, the large. Citrine, citrine heart there it is in it um yes the heart does remove and in fact there are two hearts <laughs> there happens to be another one that can be replaced this was cut uh custom cut at at carbon carbon french and i believe it's 732 carats a beautiful citrine um the story again my father has a tale behind this piece which is he believes it's a was a russian uh story of a peasant boy who was totally in love with a peasant girl he professed finally professed his love for her but she rebuffed him and he slinked off and he he tried to console himself but he finally came back to her pushing a wheelbarrow saying, my heart is so heavy, it would take a wheelbarrow to carry it. And there's that inspired this, this piece. You... Uh, yeah, and here's, uh, and this has a secret switch too. Oh yeah. So it's pushing the wheelbarrow forward, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, the whole wheelbarrow actually slides on, that's an amethyst geode that it's sitting on. Just every, everyone in the know knows amethyst is usually purple which it is, but on the geo, the outside here is, is green. 
Here's another question. Where are the employees in the atelier from? Are they also French trained? Is there comparable training available in the United States? Uh, um, okay, there is some training in, available in the United States. For instance, FIT has a um, training program and um, the, uh, a former Carbon French designer is the director of design education at FIT, Kim Nelson. Um, the majority of people are from other countries. And, and, and uh, as it's been called a, a veritable uh, United Nations of talent at, at, at Carbon French. And they come really from all over the world, um, a lot from East Asia and also South America, Europe, um, you name it. It's really an international crew. Um, another question, who owns the objects where there is no information about ownership listed? <laughs> yeah, it's owned by our family. And that, uh -huh. that also, I want to just say too, we haven't, uh, we, we've not dated these objects because as Carol said, they were worked on over a period of many, many years. So in, in some respects, it freed us from having to have all of the text listed. Um, I want to point out that there are other objects that are owned by other, other people out there, but this, this, um, this exhibition is the objects that are, are owned by our family. Here's a, a question about clocks. What kind of mechanisms are used in the clocks and can they be accessed for repairs? Hmm. Um, yes, they can be accessed for repairs, but not easily. And uh, I don't think that was a priority when they were made. <laughs> They're both um, uh, traditional mechanical and as well as some of them are quartz. Uh, here's another question. Is it more difficult to get these beautiful raw materials? Is it more difficult now? I, yeah, I, I think now. Them. Yeah. Um, huh. I would say yes and no. Um, there, some of them, it's not impossible. It's, it's fairly easy to get, to get the raw materials. Some of them, like the chrysoprase from the flooded mine, not easy, <laughs> not easy to find. Um, lapis lazuli is readily available, but it's of varying qualities. And I think the qualities that were used in these objects was is top quality, but you can find them. Um, some of these really huge specimens like this huge citrine, it's, it would be difficult to find um, to find something that that stunning and that and that large. but, uh, by and large, um, yes, you can find them. Here's another question. Uh, did your father ever wish to return to France to work? Mm. Um, you know, I've asked him, has he, ha did he wish to return? No, he didn't. He, he hasn't wished to return uh, to France. Of course, he's visited frequently. And all of his family, except for my cousin Sylvain, um, stayed in France. And um, so he was the first one and only one of his direct family to to emigrate to the United States. So, of course, his you know, he has one foot in France all the time and, and half his heart as well. But I, he really, um, really adopted um, his 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 home of choice, the United States, and is a, a real patriot of the United States. Um, thank you so much, Carol. We have run out of time, unfortunately, and um, you know we could talk about this for a long time. Um, thank you all so much for your participation and for your exceptional support for the New York Historical Society. We hope you can come see the show, see the exhibition. Again, it's Enchanting Imagination, the Objet d'Art of Andre Chervin and Carvin French Jewelers on view through March 17th. And the exhibition features an audio tour with some of Carol's stories. She narrates the audio tour. And I also want to put in a plug for the beautiful catalog that we've produced. Wow. Carol's going to model it for you. And um, so please, please do purchase the catalog as well. And thank you and good evening. Thank you very much, Deborah. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Carol.